Good morning, church. It's good to see you here. How many were here for Sabbath school? You guys are the champions. Who will be here for Sabbath school next week? Can I say this as we start, before I even welcome you? Next week at Sabbath school, and I hope Aaron's listening, there'll be no Sabbath school lessons outside. We'll all be in here. It's united. We're all together. There will be kids' Sabbath schools, but everyone else will be in here because we have something very special. It starts, what time does Sabbath school start, church? It starts at 10 o'clock. And what's happening is the leader, his name is We Sung. We Sang. We Sang Good. (laughs) We Sang. He's from Singapore. But listen to this. He is the leader of the Bible Society in China. And he has the most amazing stories about what God is doing in this country where the gospel is exploding. Now, if you go to church in China and it starts at 10 o'clock, you better be there at 8.30 or you're not getting a seat. Because their church goes from 10 o'clock till 7 or 8 o'clock at night, straight through, they stop for lunch and they go again. The Christian message and the Adventist message is just exploding in China. And what's central to it is the Bible. And how the Bible is going to the Chinese is one of the great Christian stories of the 21st century. So you need to be here next week to hear this guy. What time? 10 o'clock. Someone said 11 o'clock. 10 o'clock. And if you want a seat, what time had you better be here? 8.30. (laughs) I will tell you something and then I'll give you a welcome and we'll say a prayer and we'll get to singing. Jesus is coming soon. And these things are happening in China and India. I can only pray, and I mean this from my heart, that they'll happen in Australia too. Amen? Now welcome. We're glad to have you at New Hope today. Stand up. Now everybody up. Turn to the person next to you before we pray and we get the Holy Spirit to bring this into real sacred time. Give them a welcome to church, especially if you don't know them, welcome them to church. Welcome, Wally. Kimberly, welcome. (laughs) You guys are busy. And while you're standing up, move to the centre because there's still a lot more people coming in here and we need these outside seats available so that as people come in, they can sit down. Move to the centre, please, folks. And stay standing, because we're about to pray, and then we're going to sing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come here to worship you. Uh, There's a special day for New Hope. We're moving from being a group to a company. That doesn't mean much except, Lord, it shows that you are blessing us and you are with us. And today as we worship in music, we give, and Lord, as we listen to the word as it's opened, may your Holy Spirit be here in great power, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Before we start, did I say we're going to take an offering up for the Bible Society next week? Yeah, we're going to take a special offering up so that they can plunge more Bibles into China, so remember that. Make sure you come 10 o'clock, this will be very special. Thank you to our musicians and our music leaders. Looking forward to some praise and worship. Man. In John 4, Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, the water that I give you will never run dry. It will always keep you filled up. And this song we're going to sing, Drinking at the Springs of Living Water. We need to have that water that never runs dry. Sing together.
the chorus again. I wish we had a mirror over there so you could see your face. <laughs> oh, happy now am I. Come on, guys. It's a beautiful song. Are you drinking at the Springs of Living Water? Amen. Thank you, singers. Are you drinking at the Springs of Living Water? Yes. Is your soul happy? Yes. Folks, this is a safe place. We all believe the same. Don't be afraid to express your joy in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's try the chorus one more time. is a wonderful thing and it's contagious too the next song we're going to sing is shall we gather at the river and i pray that one day we all will be there because our faith is based on jesus christ let's sing the song together What a day that will be. Amen. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Adventist Christians, I love you. All righty. The next song we're going to sing is Wonderful, Wonderful People. And when we get together in Jesus Christ, it's a great time. Amen. Because we're there where the Spirit of the Lord is. God's wonderful people.
Good morning, New Hope. We have some exciting announcements today, and Sia would like to tell you about the first one. Oh, okay. I go first. Okay. Um, welcome. Okay, the announcement is, this is for the teens. As you all know as parents, what's coming around the corner? Holidays. School holidays. And luckily for me, my kids get three weeks. That's a crime, I reckon. <laughs> three weeks of school holidays. Uh, so, for the teens, we do have a teen program. So, it's on the second week of the school holidays. I know some kids have two weeks holidays. Um, so it's on the 13th, 14th, 15th, which is a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, so we have the winter lights at Parramatta. So this is like a festival where they have a outdoor ice skating ring, they'll have food stall, they'll have other stuff. I'm sure the kids will love this. So uh, for Thursday and Friday, Hunty, thank you. He's going to be our bus driver. Kids love travelling on the bus. They're just constantly like this. Uh, so it's part of the social. So if you want your children to come, I would love to encourage you to please let them come. They'll have a great time. Hunty and I will look after them. And we will <laughs> finish it off on the 15th. We're going to have a dress-up party, and the theme is countries. Um, I don't know about you, but social is such an important thing for young people. I have so many um, older people who have come to me and said, Sia, I hope you're still going to be around to run this program when my kids become a teenager. Because when I was going to church, when I was a teenager, we had nothing. And I said, I think I'm going to be a grandmother by the time your kid <laughs> becomes a teen. Be fun. Yeah, I'll still be fun though. I love it. So please come and see me. Uh, because I need to book it in next week. Thank you. Thank you, Sia. Next week, oh, come, Lizka, come. Lizka has, a, has an announcement she'd also like to make. <laughs> and then I'll finish. Yeah. Okay. An announcement, first announcement. I have set up a table with lost property. People came and left stuff behind. It's just outside here, where there's a table outside here, it's all there. Please collect your stuff. Even when you think you never left anything behind, you might be surprised. There's something that belongs to you there. And once you collect it, please take it with you, because otherwise I have to take it home. If you don't collect it, I'll put it on eBay. <laughs> you have to bid. Okay, next one. Um, we, who's heard of Adra Black Town Center, drop-in center? ADRA, ADRA Blacktown Drop-In Centre, very important ministry for the Adventist Church here in Sydney, right in our backyard. It's winter, they're running out of food, and it's quite serious. In fact, as our economy contracts, not that we're in recession yet, but 
People are losing jobs. Times are tough out there. They're, they're coming to Adra Blacktown Drop-In Centre for food. Now, Lisk has got a list here. And we want to start bringing even more food to church every Sabbath. And what she wants you to do is come and see her after church. And there's different types of food you can bring. And what Liska would like you to do is bring, and what we'd like to do as a church is to bring the, the one f- type of food every week. So the Grolleman family, the Grolleman, we're a donata, we might choose to bring two cans of baked bean. So we bring two cans of baked beans every week, every Sabbath. And so you can sign up to the different foods. Liz will be there after church. And I, I just want to, um, is that it? Do you want to say any more on that? Yeah, instead of, you know, thinking what should I bring or adding five different items or Adra, you just need to remember to buy one thing. You can... And bring it every week. Yeah, bring it every week. You can buy more than one, but just one item. So, so we get variety every week and we make sure we have enough. Like if 100 people sign up, we have 100 items every week. Who commits to that? We do. Well, you make sure you come and see Lizzie because we're helping the poor in our area. It's very important, isn't it? Very important. I think God looks at us to make that sort of difference in our community. Can I say one other thing? This afternoon, we're graduating that's a big deal, isn't it? Come on, say it is. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're, we're going from being a, a group to a company. Hallelujah. <laughs> and what it really is, is a time to celebrate and remember the goodness of God. And so 2.30 this afternoon here in the church, I want you all to invite you all to stay for lunch and come to this program. It is really important. The conference president will be here. This is the launch, the official launch actually of New Hope Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it is a big deal. And so we're going to have lunch and then we're going to have this meeting and then we're going to have dessert after lunch. Is that right, Enid? Correct, yes. One more thing. If you haven't, if you've got a teen and you don't, and I'll say this gently and very carefully, but I, when I was young, I come from a poor family. Uh, and I know what it's like to grow up. My dad looked after us wonderfully. And, and he was great with money and finances. But when I was very young, we were from a poor family. And a lot of us come from poor families. And if you're struggling to pay for your teens to go to these programs, please, and I, I, I appeal to you parents, go and see Andrew Hunt. He's not going to ask any questions. He's just going to make sure that that child or children goes for free. Hallelujah, amen. Amen. We never, ever want a teen or a young person to miss out in our church because of money. Oh, yes, Miss China, this lady. She says, if anyone wants to sponsor, come and see her. <laughs> I'm in trouble when we get home now. I'm going to preach a long service. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lloyd. Um, adventurers started too. So if your children are adventurers' age, which is, tell me the ages again for adventurers. Is it four to nine? Lizzie, four to nine. If you have four to nine year old children, please don't forget that they have something to be involved in as well. So it's not just for teens, the fun stuff at church. We have stuff for the little ones as well and pathfinders too. So don't forget that your kids have so much to be involved in. We have um, small groups as well. And I know many of you are involved in small groups, but for those of you who haven't yet joined one but would like to join a Bible study midweek, please come and see us. We have them going in numerous places across Sydney. What would you like, Lloyd? I've got one more announcement. (laughs) The reason I was telling you about this afternoon is who considers themselves a Foundation New Hope member? It's not too late to be one, but this is very important. Hear this. At the conclusion of this service, and I think I'm going to say this again after the sermon to remind you, Liz will be sitting out there at the desk with the computer. One, because they're going to read out the foundation members this afternoon. One, you make sure that your name is on that list. Liz is going to be there, and if it's not, we will add you today. It's not too late to get into the ark, brothers and sisters. The door is open. (laughs) And we've added half a dozen or more this morning already. But if you want to be a foundation member, and this is history, you need to see Liz on the way out and you need to put your name down if you haven't. But if you think you are, still check, please. Did you hear me? Check. I don't want anyone coming to me and saying, well, I'm a foundation member and how come my name wasn't read out? Well, your name wasn't read out because you didn't check. And I'll give you a warning. We have had some trouble in this process with computers and people, people being Lloyd. 
you're, you might think your name is on it and it's not. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. So please, will you check? New Hope members? Praise God. Thank you. Okay, we have lunch today, guys. Don't forget, if this is your first time here at New Hope, we have lunch for everybody. So whether you brought food or not is irrelevant, you are invited. So please stay for lunch. Spend some time getting to know us and help us, please, to meet you. If this is your first day here or even if you're second or third or fourth and somehow we have missed you, please come and, come and see us and say, hey, I'm new and I want to be part of the family too and stop snobbing me. Because sometimes people will slip through the cracks and we don't want you to feel like that here at New Hope because we love everyone and we don't want to miss you because we want to know you too. So that is important, okay? Come and see us if we haven't seen you. It's come now time for our prayer. And here at New Hope, we have different, different practices, but I like to spend time where you guys have silent time to pray for the things on our list and your own things. And then at the end, I finish. So start thinking about what you want to pray for. And I'm going to give you like a full minute of silent prayer so you can pray by yourself. But here are some of the people who have requested some of the prayers that were in the box today. Um, you guys know Stefan, right? Farkas. You guys remember Stefan? His dad remembers him. That's good. Um, the Stefan has moved away and he's living down in Victoria in this little country town working on an olive farm. And he's uh, alone there in his faith. And he, there is a request here. I'm assuming it's from his mum and dad. That we will pray that the Holy Spirit can talk and explain the reasons and the hope of his faith through him to the people around him. So let's pray for Stefan that he can be a witness out there to the Aussies in a country Victoria. Let's also pray for um, another person who is a friend of the family who has been struggling to quit smoking. They want to quit, but they're having trouble. So let's pray that God will give them the victory over smoking as a habit and free them from that addiction. We have a request that please could you pray for my sister that she'll be able to to tackle the burdens of her problems in her life. Please pray for my youngest daughter and my family to come to know Jesus. Please pray for my children to give their lives to the Lord. Our friend Faye is over in Iran at the moment and, and she is working with her sister who is depressed. And Grace would like us to pray, please, for Faye and for her sister because it's really difficult. If you've ever tried to work with someone who has depression and help them, it's a very depressing thing on you as well. So let's pray for both Faye and for her sister, Betty, that they will be able to, to get through this time of trial. Our family members here, Lily and Peter, if you don't know who Lily and Peter are, they're sitting three rows from the front. You should come and meet, meet them because they have some amazing stories to tell. But this week they had a, a sad time as Lily's, Lily's father passed away. So let's pray for Lily and for Peter and for their family and let them know that we love them and that it's not long now to the resurrection and we'll see our loved ones again. So let's pray for Lily and her family. We have a request here that the Lord please bless the doctor and the medical treatment that my sister is receiving so that she can be finally free from disease. My son's mental health is quickly deteriorating. Please pray for him. Rhiannon. Rhiannon's mom had what we think is a stroke. Last, was it last night, Rhiannon? Yeah. Let's pray for Rhiannon's mum. She's been really sick. She's in hospital right at the moment. They've done MRIs and Rhiannon says that they found four evidences of it being a stroke. So let's pray for her. That's a very stressful time for her and her family. So let's pray for the whole family. Hunty's mum, Hunty's dad, also had something happen this week of some pretty significant med medical problem. He nearly died. So let's pray for Hunty's dad. And last but not least, Jackie has put in a request here for her friend Mitchell who's battling with alcohol addiction and for his family who are trying to help him recover. There is so much that we have in our church family and I'm sure in our own hearts too. So let's bring our requests and our thank yous before God now. He hears everyone and at the end I'll finish with prayer. So let's just bow our heads now in silent prayer.
Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning knowing that even though you live in heaven, that you condescend to be with us here today. And we know that you hear the heart of each person here. You hear our, our cries and our joys. Father, we pray today especially for those who are hurting, who have lost the people that they love. Father, whether it be through death or through rejection or a feeling of hopelessness, Father, we just, we ask that you will one day bring us together again. We can't wait to that day when we see you come and we see our loved ones with new bodies and new young, happy faces, Father, ready to spend eternity with you and with us. Father, we, we, this is our hope and this is why we, we are so grateful for what Jesus did on Calvary for us. Father, we, we bring before you each person's request today. We ask that you will rescue our families, that you will bring back our children to you, that you will heal the broken in body and in mind, and Father, that you will just use us as a witness in wherever we are to spread the good news that you come to heal the brokenhearted, you've come to heal the sick and to give life to the dead. Father, we look forward so much to seeing your face one day soon, and we leave our hearts and our problems in your hands today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Kids, it's your time now. We're going to sing the kids song first before we do the offering.
you, children. That was wonderful. Please return your instruments and find your seat with mum and dad. It's offering time now. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. I'd like to actually ask you all to open your Bibles, if you have, to Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 12. And I'm going to put myself as the man in here, and I'm going to read it. It's going to go this way. Praveen, you robbed me. And I asked God, how did I ever rob you? In tithes and offerings, God said, you are under a curse. Wow. The whole nations of you. That means not only me, but others too. Because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. I will prevent, prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all nations will call you blessed for yours will be delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. What a promise for each one of us. Have we trusted God in giving your tithes and offering? Something to think about, isn't it? As we actually collect our offering today, let us remember that we are worshiping God in what we give. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you give us this opportunity to know you better, and we thank you that you have sustained us all through the week, and you've given us an opportunity to, to praise and give honor to you. Dear Lord, as we now open our hearts to you by giving a bit out of what we have, may you bless us abundantly as you have mentioned in Malachi. Dear Lord, may you bless us abundantly, and may you give us an opportunity to know you more. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In actual fact, there is um, one more thing that I'd like to share with you. If it's hard for you to go to an ATM and pull out cash and give it to us, we have another option, and that is through e-giving. And I think it's on the screen there. If you actually go to um, myadventist.org, no, no, sorry. It's findjesus.tv and just hit that donate TV ministry. Just hit that and it automatically takes you to the e-giving website. And you can even pay directly into our church. That's the most convenient way of paying. Uh, we're going to sing a song while we're taking the offering. And the song is The Longer I Serve Him.
going to sing the song before the sermon and it's a spirit song if you could stand with me and we can sing the song inviting the holy spirit to be here with us I'm looking for my pulpit. It's coming. <laughs> Thank you, Conrad. Where do you want it, Andrew? As we're singing that song, I was thinking about how we need to remember, remember Button Gonzaga, our music leader, who is also sick, really sick. She's about to have a baby. She was supposed to be here playing the piano today. And Christine, thank you for filling in at 
a couple of hours, if that, notice. And um, I know Button would appreciate that, but I know she would also appreciate our prayers. She's a very important part of our church, and she's not far from having this little baby boy, and I'm not sure what's wrong, but she's sick, and really sick. So let's remember her in our prayers. This is the... <clears throat> This is the third sermon in a series of three on the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it is an important series. And if I go over some things today that you've heard in the previous two sermons, there's a reason for that. Because I don't think there's any more important sermon or series of sermons I preach than this. It's... Very sobering. I pray to God it's very convicting. And I pray it'll make a difference in your heart. I'm going to make a call today. I don't do that this often, that often in this church. But I'm going to make a call to action at the conclusion of this Bible study. And I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit will work on your heart and call you to what I'm trying to share with you. I've been watching on Netflix... My daughter, I think I told you before, got Netflix. And uh, then somehow she got my credit card to pay for Netflix under her name. And so thank you, Hannah. Now I have Netflix on my credit card every month. So I look at it here and there, and there's this program on Netflix that I've been getting into. It's called Life Below Zero. Have you ever heard of it? It's a series on Netflix. It's a documentary series on people who live in Alaska. And it does two things to me when I watch it. Number one, and this causes Luska concern, it makes me want to go and live in Alaska. It's an amazing place. And it's a cold place. And did you know that winter is eight or nine months of the year at Alaska? And in deep winter, the sun doesn't shine. And it's an amazing place documentary to watch as these three or four, I think up to five different people and families live their lives in Alaska and they're living lives that you and I can't imagine. The second thing it does for me when I'm watching this program, so it makes me want to live in Alaska and at the very least, Liska, if we could just save some money up, we're going to go and visit Alaska one day. But the other thing it makes me want to do, and you should praise God for this, it makes me want to work. To get out, don't... It makes me get out and want to do work. Well, that lasts at least 10 minutes when I get out to the farm and that one dissipates. But it is, is, is a very interesting story. And I'm going to pray in a minute to start this, this uh, Bible study. But I want to just tell you a story before I pray that comes out of Alaska. And there's a reason I'm, I want to share this story with you as we look at this study today. Because I, I think it illustrates um, how I feel. When I share this with you, the Church of God, and with the people on television, our community, there was two men in Alaska. And I've noticed on this show that often they go fishing on the ice. And these two men were fishing on the ice, and they're fishing in the ice, on the ice in light winter. In other words, when winter is in Alaska, but the light is coming out and they're headed to spring. And when Spring comes in Alaska, it's very dangerous on the ice. In fact, one of the girls, one of the ladies in this show lost her brother and her mother and her sister on the ice in Alaska. Because when the ice cracks and you fall into the river, it's still so cold that you freeze to death in moments. And it's, an, it's a dangerous place. And one of the most dangerous places in Alaska is on the ice or on the river. And these two men were fishing on the ice when all of a sudden there was a great crack and the ice cracked and it began to drift away from the shoreline. Well, one of the men realizing what had happened, he instantly took action. I want you to get this. He instantly took action and he ran along the ice and he took a great jump and he landed on the bank of the river and he was safe. But the other man on the ice, he hesitated. He hesitated. And the man on the river said, quick, quick, John, run, jump, 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 save your life. And he hesitated. And he didn't move. And every moment he felt on the ice and he didn't run and he didn't jump. 
the flow drifted further and further out into the river and down into the ocean. And finally, it was too late. And in desperation, his friend ran along the bank and watched as his fishing mate floated down through the river mouth and out to sea and was never seen again. That's Alaska. And that's the dangers of fishing in that country. But it reminds me of this subject. And I don't know how other pastors feel, but when I look at your faces, I care for you. And I want you to be in the kingdom. I desperately want you to be in heaven. We were singing that song today, Shall We Gather at the River? That's talking about heaven. And I got a bit teary as I'm imagining what it's going to be like in heaven. When we walk through those pearly gates and we look up at Jesus and we walk through and we say, it was all you, it was all you. And that first worship service on the sea of glass, I hope when we get to heaven, I don't have to preach for a million years. I'll be done preaching because I'm going to listen to Jesus. But before we get to heaven and before we experience all this, we have a wide river to cross. And what I'm sharing with you this morning and what I've shared with you in the last two sermons, and if you haven't got a hold of them and you weren't here and you didn't hear them, go back and look at them. I'm not saying that because I'm preaching them. I'm sharing this with you because of the message that I'm preaching. This is the key. This is why. The Adventist church in some areas of the world and the Christian church is on fire. And it's why in other areas, and I, I to, to, to my pain, I've got to acknowledge here in Australia, largely, we're not on fire. There's a reason why when you go to China and you go to church in China, you've got to line up at 8.30 to get a seat when the church starts at 10. There's a reason why in India... The message is going so hard and so fast that the church structurally can't keep up with the building of churches and supplying pastors. It can't do it. And this message is the reason. And so one more time, I want to share with you the power of the message of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And don't, don't, don't be like the man on the ice floe who saw that he needed to jump and never did. And I fear for many Adventists and Christians in Australia that that will be the case, that they will see, they will hear this message from preachers and teachers from the pulpits and yet they will never jump, they will never make that decision to invite the Holy Spirit into their lives. What I'm talking to you about now is not a cliche. This is where the rubber hits the road when it comes to Christianity. And if you can get this, your Christian experience with God will explode, but if you never get it, and you might keep coming to church for the rest of your life. But you'll have no fire and you'll have no reason. And tragically, you have no experience. And I don't want that for you. And when Jesus comes, make no mistake, he's coming for people who are baptized of the Holy Spirit. And I want to ask you a question before I pray now. Are you baptized by the Holy Spirit? I want you to answer it yourself. If you don't know, you're not. If you're baptized by the Holy Spirit, you know it. Are you baptized by the Holy Spirit? It's the key question. That life that God will throw at you, it is the key question. Are you baptized by the Holy Spirit? Let's pray. Father, in this very important subject, one more time as we look at it, I again pray for the Holy Spirit in this room. He's been here through the beautiful worship and the music and the giving. And I just pray, God, that he'll touch hearts now. Thank you, Jesus, I pray in your name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to open them to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Don't worry too much about the screen. I'd rather, if you have your scripture, you'd be looking in your own Bible. I'm happy for you to look at your own translation. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. And this, this, this passage of scripture 
it begins to unlock for us why we find it so difficult as human beings living in Australia experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I've got to tell you right at the start of this last sermon in this series that there are some challenges that we are confronted with when it comes to experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if you are cold to God today, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you are ambivalent to God today, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you don't care about God today, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you're not on fire, if God is not central in your life, if He's not the most important thing in every day that you live, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The church, the Adventist church, the Christian church in Australia, the Christian church in America, in the Western world, its desperate need is not for money. It's not for preachers. It's not for big churches. It's not for beautiful television ministries. God's church in the Western world, its greatest desperate need is for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the one thing we struggle with in our church more than any other is that we don't have this experience and there are some road blockages to us having this experience and I want to look at them this morning because I pray through that same Holy Spirit that I want to see in your hearts and in mine and man, is this a message for me. I want to pray that these blockages will be blown away by God. Here's the blockage, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things, and it's desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Now, that's that's a pretty unpopular approach to humanity today. I'm watching all these self-help shows on TV. Well, I'm not because Lizka doesn't let me have a television, but... I'm watching all these things on the internet where you get these gurus and you get these self-help. They do yoga. Sometimes you've got a pastor and they're all saying to you, believe in yourself. Reach deep inside to yourself. Your heart will lead you. It will guide you. Follow your heart. Have you heard that? Well, I'm here today to tell you, don't follow your heart. Ask for a heart transplant. Because if you follow your heart, the Bible says your heart. Now, I want you to be confronted with this. And and I know it confronts us. It confronts me. I'm talking about Lloyd Groleman's heart too. The Bible says here the heart is the most deceitful of all things. That's your heart the Bible's talking about. That's my heart. It's desperately wicked. Oh, 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 just a minute, Lord. It's desperately wicked. And then it says, who really knows how bad it is? I was thinking of an illustration I could use. I was going to use an illustration, a story of myself, but it kind of got too close to home. But I think as Christians, and and a lot of us who are sitting here today in this church are Christians. A lot of watching this on TV are Christians. I think as Christians, we think our hearts are pretty good. Oh, I gave my heart to Jesus. My heart's okay. Well, I'm all right. Well, I go to church. I pay my tithes and I pay my offerings and I dress up nicely and I'm quite generous and I'm kind to that bloke at work and sometimes I give some money to the guy on the street on my way to work so he can go to McDonald's and get a burger for breakfast, that homeless guy. My heart's okay. Well, that's not what the Bible says and I think we're struggling with this as Christians. So I'm looking for a story. I had to go right back. And this is one God convicted me to tell and a lot of you know this story about Huss and Jerome. Huss was born in 1369. Jerome was born in 1379, 10 years later, 10 years difference between these two powerful preachers, Reformation preachers of Jesus Christ. These were men who stood up to the state church and they said, you are saved, and they preached this to Europe in the 13 and the 1400s. They said, you are saved by grace and you are saved by grace and faith in Jesus alone. And they were powerful messages and they had the Holy Spirit in them and they were set in a place on fire. Huss, who was the elder and the leader between the two missionaries, pastors, preachers who'd been called by God in Czechoslovakia, well, Slovakia and the Czech Republic, this ancient area of Europe in the 13 and the 1400s. Huss was the leader. He was trapped by the state church. They'd invited him into the city, into Prague, 
to give a defense of his gospel and he'd gone, he'd been arrested and he was put in jail. Now, Huss and Jerome were very close friends. They were colleagues. You remember the Bible verse, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. These two men are reformers. They're standing up for God when no one else would. They're preaching the gospel when the state church wanted to take them and put them to a stake and burn them to death. And here's Huss, he's in jail, and Jerome had made a promise to him. Because when Huss said, well, I'm going to go to Prague and I'm going to give a defense of the gospel, Jerome had said, well, if they capture you, because they had promised, the state had promised, the government and the church at the time had promised, if you come to Prague, Huss, we will not put you in jail, we will not persecute you, we'll care for you, we'll look after you, we just want to hear what you've got to say. He gets to Prague, they put him in prison. And they're going to burn him at the stake. And Jerome had said to Huss, well, look, if they do that to you, I promise I'll come, I'll come. And Jerome, Jerome, he thought his heart was good. He was sure that he would stand for God when it came for it. Well, well, here's Huss in prison. Jerome rides in like a knight in armour to Prague. It caused a stir, rode into this city to rescue Huss. I don't know how Jerome thought he was going to do it. But he gets to the city, amazing. He gets down off his horse and his friends and supporters saw him and said, what, what, are you, what are you doing in here, man? You're mad. They've arrested Huss, now they're going to arrest you and you're both going to be burned at the stake. You know what he did? The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. He jumped on his horse and he rode for the border as fast as he could. But as he's riding... They caught him and they brought him and they dragged him and they put him into prison too. You know, they got Huss. Oh, something had happened to Huss. Something in his experience got him to hold firm. And they got Huss and they, they, they got Huss and they, they took him out and they tied him to a stake and they burned him alive. And then they said to Jerome, if you don't recant this foolish belief, that you are saved by Jesus and Jesus alone will do the same to you. Now, I want you to read the text one more time. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Jerome recant and he signed the paper. He knew the gospel. He had preached it, he had lived it, he had taught it, and he he betrayed the Reformation, he betrayed Huss, and he betrayed God. He thought he'd get free from prison, they never let him go. They came back to him four or five months later. End of the story, he'd had time to think about what he'd done. They didn't really believe that he'd recanted. His belief that you're saved by Jesus and faith in him alone. They asked him to sign again. And this time he refused because something happened to his heart in that four to six months that he was in jail. He refused. And on May the 30th, 1416, they marched him out into exactly the same square where they'd burned Huss. And they tied him to a stake. And they lit the fire. And witnesses say that as the fire rose up around him, He thrust his right hand into the fire and cried out, never will I betray my Lord again. But you know what? Even when you're a reformer, even when you're a preacher, even when you're a Christian, even when you're an Adventist, we have to come to grips today with the fact that our hearts are the most deceitful of all things. And they are desperately bad. Well, how bad is it? So I've got a heart. It's not a good heart. Sorry, Lizzie. It's not a good heart. I want it to be a good heart, but it's not a good heart. And we laugh at Lloyd, but you've got a bad heart too. That's what the Bible says. We've all got bad hearts. Well, how bad is it? Well, look at this. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. I want you to look at this. So we've already found out that the heart is bad, desperately bad, desperately wicked. Now look what the Bible says. Jeremiah 13, verse 23, talking about the heart. Oh, this is bad news. Can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Can a leopard take away his spots? 
Neither can you start doing good, for you have always done. Can an Ethiopian change the colour of his skin? Now, I find this amazing, actually. Here in Australia, we want to be what? If we're white, what do we want to be? Browner. But if you go to Asia, where Liska's people come from, and she's a nice golden brown. Praise the Lord for that, Liska. I love your brown skin. And you go to Africa, where I've been, well, I haven't been up to Ethiopia, but I've been to uh, South Africa, and I've seen the Zulus, one of the most handsome, beautiful races on the planet. Beautiful, dark, black skin, striking features. And the Bible says, can an Ethiopian, can a Zulu change the color of his skin? What's the answer? Well, you know, in Asia, they think they can. Because they go to the chemist and they get this cream, hey, Liska? And you put this cream on you and it's like, why would you want to be white? Andrew and I will tell you, that's not the right color you want to be on this planet, is it? I laugh at Andrew. I love the fact that when we go out filming, within two minutes of being out in the sun, and it can be raining, it can be in the middle of a storm, he's getting sunburned. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Five minutes and it's happening to me. You don't want white skin. But you know what, Andrew? You can never change that beautiful white skin of yours. Lizga, you can't change your brown skin. If you're a Zulu, you cannot change your black skin or an Ethiopian. What God has given you, you are. Can I see a hallelujah, amen? amen? And to me, it's a sad thing that God's creative nuances, His creative abilities in making us all different colors are used to a disadvantage by the devil to separate us. Terrible, isn't it? But God's making a point here. He says, hey, if you've got black skin or you've got white skin, if you've got brown skin, you can't change it. They can put as much cream on them as they like in age and they can spend it as a multi-billion dollar industry. Lizzie, you're going to be brown till Jesus comes. And Andrew, you're going to be white till Jesus comes. It's just how it is. I, I've seen leopards. They go shooting leopards sometimes on these hunting safaris in Africa. Guess what? You can shoot a leopard, don't do it. I think they're beautiful animals. They're fierce, dangerous animals. I've seen one. Well, I saw one in a tree in Africa. I couldn't even see him for five minutes. The guide says, he kept saying to us, he's up there, he's up there in the tree. And I'm going, where is he? He's up there. Come on, you, come on, you Aussie boy. You can see. I can't see. Why couldn't I see him? Because he's got spots. And the spots camouflage him. That's how God made him. But you could shoot a leopard. You could skin him. God forbid you do that. You shoot a leopard, you skin him, guess what? You can put his skin through the wash. The spot's still there when it comes out. Get this, get this. You can't change your heart. I'm going to say this five times. You can't change you can't change, you can't change, you can't change, you can't change. Do you get that? What is your heart? Is it good or bad? Can you change it? No, 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 you can't. Someone said yes, I'm going to say it again. I'll say it five times again. You can't change your heart, you can't change your heart, you can't change your heart. You oh, it's getting a bit monotonous, isn't it? You can't change your heart it's bad it's wicked you can't change it now put a full stop there just for a moment and think think about yourself you can't change you so when we're talking about our sexuality and people are saying, I'm born this way. It's how I am. It's how I'm created. I can't change. And we get on Facebook and we say, of course you can. It's your choice. You can do whatever you want. Are they right? They can't change? I can't change my heart. Are you with me on this? So when they say, I can't change, are they right? Tell me, when someone says, I'm like this, it's, it's my persuasion, it's, it's how I'm bent, it's the way my mind thinks. I can't change. Are they right? Are they? I can't hear. 
Yes. Someone's saying no. But he sounded young. Thor. I want you to change that answer, son. You can't change. I think you got that. I don't think I need to say that anymore. So what is Jesus' solution? A little bit of revision, then I'll bring this thing home. John 3, verse 3. Talking about the heart. Talking about the human heart, which is deceitful, which is desperately wicked. Talking about the human heart, that like an Ethiopian, can't change. Like an Ethiopian can't change his skin, the human heart can't change. Like a leopard can't change its spots, the human heart can't change. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is specifically what he's addressing and what Jesus says to us today. Now, this is revision for a moment. Bear with me if you've seen this, if you know it, if you've been here and we've looked at this before. There's a reason I'm going here. I want to re I want to re-emphasize this truth. I want to re-emphasize this truth to this church. I was thinking the other day, 23 years I've been a pastor. I've been in at least 10, maybe 12 different churches. This is the first church I've ever had anything to do with when it comes to raising a church. This afternoon, something special is going to happen. I want to make sure I invite you all there. Because we're going to go from being a church group to a church company. I don't care about that, to be honest. Sorry, I hope the president's not looking at this. What I care about is what's happening in this church. And whether or not we're just going to become a church like many other churches and just float on into mediocrity. We're going to be just like a normal church and happy when the church is full like it is today. Or are we desiring something more? Is there a fire burning in us, driving us further? So Jesus says, hey, my church is full of people. The world is full of people whose hearts are deceitful, are desperately wicked, whose hearts they cannot change. This is what he said to do, John 3 verse 3. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's radical. That's more than a heart transplant. God's saying you need a complete transplant. You have to be what? Born again. Now, I've got to tell you, and I've said this before in this series, but I don't mind going back on this for a minute because it's so important. I have heard that message preached over and over since I was a small boy, an Adventist boy in Sabbath school growing up in the Adventist church going to camp meetings. I heard it. Be born again. Be born again. Be born again. Have you heard it? And it kind of just floats over us. And yet here we've got probably some of the most important words that Jesus, our Saviour, the Master, the Creator of the world and the King of the universe, these are some of the most important words He ever said to us. And I don't know what a pastor, a preacher has to do. I don't know what we as a people have to do to understand the importance of these words except say, Holy Spirit, please touch us. Touch us, Lord, with this message. So how are you born again? Verse 6, Jesus doesn't muck around. He says, humans can, repu- humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. Now Lizzie and I are getting, she's gone. I'll say this because she's gone. We're getting old, probably pretty hard for us to produce human life. I'm 53 and she's 30. Tell her I said that. But we've got Button and Daryl in our church about to, through the grace of God, produce human life. Humans can produce humans. But what humans cannot do is they cannot bring about this born-again experience. Listen to this. Humans, this is Jesus, can, repu- can re- reproduce only human life. But the Holy Spirit, verse 6, gives birth to spiritual life. You cannot fix yourself. You've got to stop trying. Only... Verse 6, only the Holy Spirit can give birth to spiritual life. So let's stop and just have a look briefly where we're at. We've got bad, wicked, deceitful hearts. We can't change those hearts. Jesus re-emphasizes this when he says humans can only reproduce human life. But what we can do, and this is where it gets important, the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. It's the Holy Spirit that will take you from where you are now and take you to a place where you are born again. So what can we do? Luke 11, let's look at this one more time. Verse 9. Luke chapter 11, verse 9. Jesus again speaking. Listen to his words. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive. 
Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks the door will be open. And then he gets to the heart of the manor. So he says, seek, knock, ask, you're going to find. That's all he's asking us to do. This is the heart of it. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? If you want to be born again, I said it last week and I'm saying it again today, ask Jesus. Did you get that? If you want to be born again, ask Jesus. And what happens? Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. And I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Some versions say my laws. I'll read it again, verse 27. And I will put my spirit in you. So you've asked. And this is what Jesus says he will do. And I will put my spirit in you so that you'll follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations or my laws. So what happens is you ask, you ask in prayer and the Holy Spirit comes because you've asked. God puts the Holy Spirit inside you and then when the Holy Spirit comes inside you, then it's the Holy Spirit that gets you to obey God's laws, His decrees, to follow in His ways. I have a mate, a really good friend. He's actually uh, pretty high in the church now. Uh, quite a few years ago now, he, he came to Jesus and he had a conversion experience. Uh, and this was the first time I really started to think about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Can you believe that? I'm well in the ministry. And this is when God started to impress this message upon me. And this guy was good looking. Oh, when we went to college, you didn't compete with this guy if you liked one of the girls. I, I tried once and, whew, man, he was scary. He was so good looking. And he just looked at a girl and she wanted to go out with him. Um, and he was suave. He was smooth with his language and he was smooth with his ways. And girls used to flock around him like bunnies, like bunnies, like honey to bees, like bees to honey. Get that right. I'm flustered when I'm telling this story. And he had a lot of girlfriends and he really played the field. And he had in what the world would say a good time. And then he has a conversion experience to Jesus Christ. He had the conversion experience. I'm not around him. I didn't see it happen. I came to visit him on holidays. I caught up with him. He said, I've been converted to Jesus. I said, man, that's because I'm a pastor. You know, I said, well, that's wonderful. He says, the Holy Spirit's come inside of me. And I said, well, that's good. Fantastic. Not thinking too much. He said, I'll tell you what a difference it's made. Now, he'd been married for quite a number of years. He says, I used to drive along in the car. And he said, every good looking girl I'd see. Now, he's married. got kids. He said, every good-looking girl, he worked for the church. Every good-looking girl I'd see, I'd be driving along my car. And I'd, I'd, he says, I'd be looking at them and I'd checking them out. Oh, that's a good-looking girl. Boy, she's beautiful. She's beautiful. He said, you know what's happened to me? I said, well, what's happened to you? I'm starting to listen now. He says, Jesus has come into my heart. I said, fantastic. He said, but I've been, I've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. And I said, what does that mean? He says, now when I'm driving along, he says, the Holy Spirit's inside of me. He says, there's no room for anyone else to get in. It's just the Holy Spirit and me. He said, I'm driving along and I see a good-looking girl walking along the street. Now, boys, man, you can't, can't ban women, good-looking women from walking down the street. Amen. I'm talking to the married man here, the married boys. I mean, if you're a single boy and you, you see a good-looking girl walking down the street, fine. As long as your mind's pure, fine. That's kind of how God designed you. But when you're married, man, the Bible says your eyes should be what? Pure. They should be one-directional. My eyes should only be for Lisker and Lisker own baby, and that's who they're for, yep. And he said, I'm driving down the street. He says, I see a good-looking girl. He says, you know what the difference is having the Holy Spirit inside of you? Being baptized by the Holy Spirit. He says, I'll tell you what the difference is. He says, I see the good-looking girl. He said, I don't look back. Did you get that? I said, why not? He said, because the Holy Spirit told me not to. I don't look back because the Holy Spirit told me not to. I started to think, and this is how it works. 
You see, my mate, God gave him, look at the verse, verse 30, chapter 36 of Ezekiel, verse 26. My mate, God gave him a new heart and he put a new spirit in him and he took out his stubborn, stony heart and he, he gave him a tender, responsive heart. So, so that when the Holy Spirit came into him, as the Holy Spirit's in him, give him this tender, responsive heart, he hears the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and he had had the Spirit put into him and now he was following God's decrees and God's laws and God's ways. He had a heart transplant and it brought about a change in his behaviour. And when you pray for this and the Holy Spirit comes into you, you will hear him. You prayed for it. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you've been and what you've done and how far you feel from God today. If you pray for the Holy Spirit, he comes into you. The question is then, will you listen? And will you obey? And my mate was listening and he was obeying and his life was changing. And that is my testimony too. And I want to finish with this because I think this is where it gets really good. So you pray for it. You pray for the Holy Spirit every day. You thank God when you experience him coming in. And he will talk to you. Am I right, Claire? He talks to you. And when he talks to you, he'll say, I want that in your life. But he'll say, Aaron, I don't want that in your life. And you choose, mate, and I choose. Am I going to listen to him? And if I listen to him, he gets more powerful. His voice gets louder in my life. And the change that happens to me is radical. And that's why you see some guys like my mate who was a serial philanderer, a serial womanizer. You see him have a conversion experience and he's a new man Amen. married to one woman. Looking at one woman sleeping, can I say, with one woman. Hallelujah. And I'm not just talking physically, I'm talking about in his head. Committed to his family, committed to God, a completely brand new man with a new heart and that's what we need. And that's where it starts. And it starts with you getting on your, on your knees and saying, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I invite the Holy Spirit in. He will come, he will come, he will come. Can you imagine for a moment that Jesus got up on the cross? Can you imagine he was nailed to the cross and his blood was shed for you and when he hears that call from you, no matter what you've done, where you've been, can you imagine he won't come? He doesn't come slowly. He rushes, he runs, he's as fast, faster than light itself. The Spirit comes into your heart. Instantly, the Spirit is in your heart. Instantly, the demons are forced out. They can't both live in the same heart together. Instantly, he begins to clean, out with you, clean you out. Instantly, he began to speak to you. Instantly, he began to change you. And the change is gradual and happens over a lifetime. And I want to finish with this in Acts chapter 2. Because this is what we need. First, we need people to have that experience. And then God leads them on to this. Look at this. Acts chapter 2. This is the early Christian church. I'm finishing on this. Oh, how we need this. If we had this experience I'm talking about today, this church would be full. We'd be running six services a day if we had this in our people. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, this is the early Christian church. Jesus has just gone back to heaven and he told them to go and wait for him. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together, waiting in one place. They'd been praying, they'd been reading the Bible, they'd been preparing for this moment. They're waiting, they didn't know what they're waiting for, but they're waiting. And maybe we're waiting today. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. What happened was they were waiting, they were converted. The Holy Spirit came to them. This was something new for this 
early Christian church, and he possessed each person in that room. And when he possessed them, not only did he start to change their lives and to talk to them, to lead them out of sin and out of their old ways and make them new men and women, and make no mistake, he did. And these people that claim they follow Jesus and are still living in purposeful sin, they, don't, they just need to go back and read the Bible and have the experience of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit will make you sinless, but he'll take you from your sins and he'll start with the ones he wants to remove and he'll spend his entire, your, your entire life making you more like Jesus. I told you about my grandmother the other day, 101 years old, just about to die. And I said to her, remember what I said? Oh, Grandma, don't tell me Jesus is still cleaning you up. Oh, yes, he is. He'll keep cleaning you up until he comes a second time and glorifies you and makes you sinless and perfect. But every day you'll become more like him. Not only does Jesus give you that experience, but this is where it gets really exciting. And I think this is where we're falling down in the Western church. He comes into you and he gives you gifts to share his power with others. Look at this. This is a end result of this day Peter gets up and preaches a sermon surrounded by people who are full of the Holy Spirit being baptized by Christ imagine they're moving amongst the crowd as they're listening to Peter everywhere they go people are getting an experience of the Holy Spirit it's a powerful thing and the end of the day verse 41 the Bible says one day those who believe what Peter said after this sermon were baptized and added to the church that day how many three thousand new members don't tell me this doesn't make a difference. Not only will it change your life, it'll change the lives of those around you. Now I want to finish on this. Now listen to this. I have preached in Papua New... God has blessed me. I have preached in Papua New Guinea, in Africa, in the South Pacific, in America, in the Philippines, and in Europe, most of the world. Some places I go and I preach and thousands and thousands of people turn up. I'm thinking of PNG in Africa and the Philippines. Other places like Australia... America, Europe, well, some turn up, but not all that many. People say to me, oh, the reason that they turn up and they come to God in Africa or in the Philippines or, or in PNG is because they're poor and they've got nothing better or they've got nothing else. Well, that says a lot about what they think about God. Look, they might have an initial interest in God because they're poor and because life is so tough. That's possible. But what is going on in those countries is what needs to go on in this country. And what is going on in those churches needs to happen in this church. And what is going on in the Chinese church, in the Indian church, the Filipino church, and the PNG church. Churches where they meet under grass thatch roofs. Churches where there is no air conditioning, where there are no lights. Churches where there are no power. And yet the gospel is going ahead like an out of control bushfire. What those churches have is what we need. Amen. And you know what it is? It's church members who are full of the Holy Spirit. When I did a program in PNG and there's 30,000 plus people at the program every, and this is a testimony I'm telling you. Every single person that I spoke to who was at that evangelism program, and oh, thousands and thousands of baptisms. People who weren't Christians, who weren't Adventists, pagans walking out of, the, out of the bush, meeting Jesus and giving their hearts to him. Every single one that I spoke to, and I'm not saying that was for everyone, but it's everyone I spoke to, and there was a lot of people I spoke to. Everyone I spoke to was brought along to the meetings by someone who is converted and baptized by the Holy Spirit. Do you get this? Do you get it? You know, Claire, you work hard to persuade us to come to Yes We Care, don't you? As a pastor, I'll talk to you from my heart. As a pastor for 28 years, I've been working hard to try and persuade people to Jesus. I work hard. The leadership of our own church works really hard to try and get people to come to Sabbath school at 10 o'clock. I talk to you from my heart. This is not going to TV, don't worry. 
We work really hard, Claire, to try and get people to, to join the Bible study classes or to go to the small groups on Wednesday night or to take positions in the church. And for 28 years, well, 25, 24 of those 28 years, I, I, to my shame, but I think I used to try and embarrass people into doing the right thing. Do you know what I'm talking about, Claire? Make you feel bad. What do you mean you went swimming on Sunday when you should have been? Yes, we care. Don't look at me too hard, please, Claire. <laughs> what do you mean you slept in on Sabbath morning instead of coming to church? Or what do you mean you're so broke you can't pay your tithe and your offerings? Or do, do you kind of know what I'm saying here? Have you heard preaching like that? Huh? It doesn't work. I came to the conclusion quite a few years ago, it doesn't work. I can't make myself feel guilty to do things, let alone you. And if I do, it might work for two or three weeks and then it runs out. So we can start a new church like this. And everything we try evangelistically to start off with will be spectacularly successful. People will turn up to everything we do. They'll turn up to Sabbath school on time. They'll come to... Claire's, I think we've had... 60 or more people at Yes We Care. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll come to all these things at church, but we run out of steam. And the reason we run out of steam when it comes to sharing Jesus is because what? We're not baptised by the Holy Spirit. Because it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that fires you to be at church. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that fires you to walk out that door at lunchtime and look for someone who's by themselves and to go and sit with them and to talk to them and to give them time and perhaps even to invite them round to your place that evening so you can talk further and develop a friendship. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that does that. And the reason we resist, and I know because I'm like this, the reason we resist these sorts of things, that's not because, well, it's, it's our hearts. Because the Bible says, and it's painful to acknowledge it, their hearts are deceitful. And we need the Holy Spirit to change them. And when he comes into our hearts, we are new people. And things that used to become, a, things that were once a burden become a joy. So I told you I'll make a little call and this is it. I just want to invite everyone to bow their heads. Everyone's got their heads bowed. TV cameras are going to be on no one. So don't worry about this. This is you and God. And uh, if you've been living your life without the baptism of the Holy Spirit trying to come to church, trying to be a good person, trying to do all the right things, but falling down all the time no matter how you try. And if you come to a place today where you'd like to invite Jesus into your heart and invite the Holy Spirit to come in and baptise you and to possess you, if you truly would like that experience, everyone's head's bowed, no one's going to look at this. And I don't mind if there's only one or two for this. This is okay. But I'm, I'm here and I'm doing it. And I'm making this commitment. If you would like to be baptised with the Holy Spirit, I just want to invite you. No one's looking. I want everyone to keep their heads bowed to just stand. If you want that, I'm standing. And I'm standing because that's, that's what I want. So no one's looking. This is very personal, intimate time. I'm not going to invite you down the front. Front. I just want you to stand. Uh, only those, I'm not even going to look at how many are standing. I just want this between you and God. I've got my eyes bowed and so is everybody else. And I want to pray. I'll just give you a few more moments if the Lord's working on your heart to stand. Lord, in many ways, we're poor people. We're living in the end of time. And we are struggling. And we're living in the West, Father. We are secular. We've been bombarded by our secular culture. 
And yet today, Father, we feel a deeper need and a deeper want. We want to truly experience you some for the first time in our lives. So we bow our heads, Lord, right now, whether you're standing or not, heads bowed, and we repent. We repent of our sins. We repent of our rebellion. We repent of our unfaithfulness. And we ask you, Jesus, to cover us and our sins with the blood that you shed on Calvary. And now that you've done that, Lord, and we believe through faith that you have, we invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts and our lives. Please come in and possess us. Recognise the need and the desire of each person standing. And bless those here who have not, not yet made that decision. This we pray in Jesus' name. And you can be seated while your eyes are still closed. Everybody be seated. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Seal us in this decision. And please, Lord, I pray as a pastor, come into our church and affect the change only you can. May this church, Lord, on this day, on this day where we graduate from being a group to a company, may this church be different in Sydney. I earnestly pray that, Lord. I don't pray, Father, for numbers in this church. Today I don't even pray for a church building. I just pray, Lord, that you will fill this church with your Holy Spirit. Because if you lay that foundation down in us, then we know that if this world closes, you can do anything. I pray for the church. I pray for the people in it. I pray for, these, for those watching this on live stream now, I ask. Hear our cries, Jesus, in your name. Amen. I'm going to invite our, our um, singers forward. We've finished that series. Um, I think I'll come back and revisit with you from time to time on this subject. But if you're still not sure and you want to know more, grab me. Or well, grab Claire, who'll be up in that back door after church. Grab us, and we will arrange for someone, whether it's me or someone else, to come and talk to you. I really mean this. These, we are talking about eternal decisions here. Let's sing this last song. It's a beauty. I need thee every hour. And I, I'm sure God will hear us as we sing this song. Let's stand.
the I want to sing the last verse one more time, but I want to say this in closing. I can't lead this church. I can't preach good enough. I cannot teach good enough, even with the Holy Spirit. I need God, and you need God to lead us in this church. Amen? Amen. And he can only do that when he's got people in the church who are baptised by the Holy Spirit. This afternoon at 2.30, this is not going to be a, a huge shindig where we pat ourselves on the back and say how good we've been. This is going to be a program where we'll start with a prayer meeting, pleading with God to help us to be what he wants us to be. Amen? I can't do it and nor can you. And I think it's time we've just got to all step back and look at God and say, take us home. You are our leader, but we've got to go through the conversion experience where we as a church are baptised by the Holy Spirit. That's what's going to make new hope different. Amen? It's not our beautiful music. Thank, thank God and the Holy Spirit and the Lord for what you got. It's not that. It's not the fellowship lunch, which is pretty good, eh? It's very good. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit amongst you and me. That's what's going to make new hope different. That's what's going to bring people here. And only then can we do what God has called us in this community to do. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Nothing is more important. Let's sing this last verse. acknowledged it today you've blessed us over the last two and a half years immeasurably more than what we could ever imagine but I know Lord and I sense you can do so much more in us and through us and so one more time as I close we come before you as a congregation and we acknowledge you as our Lord and our God we cry out for the faith of the reformers the protestant reformers Give us their courage. And may the Holy Spirit that drove them to death, Lord, drove them to the death for your gospel. May that same Holy Spirit drive us now through these end times. I pray God one more time as I close. Through the Holy Spirit, please Jesus, hear our plea, hear our cry. Make us a different church because of you, and your possession of us, your people. I pray that, Jesus, in your name. Amen. I want to invite you to stay for lunch for this afternoon, 2.30. And if you want to be a foundation member, please, Liska, run out there now, baby. Liska's going to be sitting at the door. Check your name is there. And if it's not, put it on. We want you to join us as we go on this journey. Thank you.
things big.